Hello, good afternoon. Uh, Asham London here again with uh, yet another top five uh, from yet <laughs> another band from my uh, teenage years that I didn't follow much in the years that followed. Um, today's band is Strobes, sometimes erroneously billed as The Strobes, uh, even on some of the streaming devices, which uh, makes it a bit confusing, but... Um, yeah, they're just Strobs. I started out uh, as the Strawberry Hill Boys. Uh, 1964 they were formed as a bluegrass band and uh, carried on. I think they're still going today. They've had a couple of uh, f uh, periods where they've stopped performing, where, they, where basically they were on hiatus for a couple of years. Once in the eight, early 80s, I think it was, and one a bit later, but they're still kind of going around today. Uh, they started out as a bluegrass band, got more folky, and then changed a little bit later and touched prog rock, classic rock, all kinds of bits and pieces, a bit of skiffle here and there. Uh, they're essentially a folk band, really. I think you can hear that through, through a lot of their stuff. Um, uh, now, I got into them uh, through Rick Wakeman, because uh, um, at school, like a lot of people at school in the, in the um, early to mid 70s i was a fan of yes and uh, there was this keyboard wizard as he was known rick waitman was a member of yes and uh, i've read interviews that uh, he was in previously he was in this band called strobes and i thought oh, i'll try those i'll give them a listen so i uh, i investigated and um, i found out they were quite different sounding to yes they had a lot more of an english sound about them because of the folk side to them whereas yes had a more of an american sound about them the more sort of west coast uh, which is fine, yeah, it was all it was all good, but um, yeah, the straws are very very different. But I, I kind of got into them. Funny thing is, looking back, I, I kind of think, Ooh, what did I see in them? Because I, I just can't listen to them now, to be honest. Really, I mean, one or two, one album probably uh, not too bad, which you'll hear about uh, in a few minutes. But yeah, it's I can't, I don't, it's just not it doesn't really appeal to me much now. This kind of stuff, the lyrics in particular. And the, the songs in general have a kind of a biblical sound about them. I don't know whether there was a that there are sort of religious uh, themes along some of the songs and the albums, some of the album sleeves as well. But uh, very spiritual and uh, those and those and these and all that kind of stuff, which uh, is not really my thing, to be honest. But uh, I did like them at the time, and um, I've got memories of uh, listening to these records, and they tie in with certain parts of my life and my teenage years. So um, I've kept the records that I had then. I did have a couple more, but uh, they got a bit damaged, so I think they went to... I think they went <laughs> so um but uh i got the top five here studio albums kind of um but yeah let's um let's crack on um they were formed um the main two um members are dave cousins and uh, tony hooper in the early days and they carried on until tony hooper left in um i think it was 73 he left or 72 because he he was he was the more folky of the the two of them he, he didn't like the way they were going with the more prog rock kind of sounds dave cousins has been a constant member throughout he's still with them to this day so um I'll make, they do look. They do have prog rock credentials in the fact they have lots of different lineups, lots of members coming and going. So um, I will mention that as I go. So anyway, Straubs top five from my teenage years. Here we go, and it's uh, the one I um, coming in at number five is the one I uh, investigated first after finding about Rick Wakeman being a member. 1971's from the Witchwood. That rather, I love the sleeve on that. It's really cool. Um, got the, that's on the back as well, really nicely. Just like, obviously a negative of a, uh, a tree. <laughs> so um, I think it's a tree anyway. It's very sort of a very sort of like a meandering tree. But uh, I thought it was really a really really cool sleeve. That. But yeah, th this was um, this was one I got into. And I thought, like I say, it was so, so different to yes. And um, what I was hearing about Rick Wakeman was he felt a bit restricted in this band, and I, and I could see it to be honest. Um, because he expanded his repertoire a lot more when he joined. Yes, got you know, um, got more uh, airtime as it were. Because he's, he's he's on these albums. He's on these albums with Straub. He appeared on three Straub's albums: two as a full member, one as a session musician. Uh, this was the the, uh, the second and the the last he was on as a um, a full time member. Left a bit uh, acrimonious. <laughs> Um, but anyway, um, yeah, it was interesting. But you can see, yeah, you can see he's a little bit restricted. It's a bit like um, Eddie Van Halen joining the Shadows, that kind of thing. You can just see he needs to get off and ex express himself a bit more. But yeah, it's not not a bad album. Um, it's Gatefold. It's a bit tatty now, this, I must admit. Uh, but um, yeah, it was pretty good. This, this lineup was um, Dave Cousins, Tony Hooper, Rick Wakeman, and Richard Hudson and John Ford, who had both joined for. 
I think it was a previous album, I can't remember. Hard to keep track of the members comings and going. Richard Hudson and John Ford, drums and bass. Um, but yeah, it wasn't wasn't a bad album. It's uh, like I say, very English in, in its sound. You got things like the Hangman and the Papist, Witchwood, which is kind of a title track. Uh, a glimpse of heaven, bringing in that kind of religious kind of uh, themes here and there. I'll carry on beside you. The Shepherd's Song. Yeah, it's all. All a bit that kind of thing. and even the the Im- image on the inside is a, an old um, tapestry uh, called the Vision of Saint Jerome, which is a tapestry from the Spanish Royal Collection, which is on the inside. So again, the kind of religious kind of themes running through here. But, um, but it was not a bad album, not that kind of thing I listen to much now. But um, worth investigating uh, for anyone who's interested in the the, the history of uh, British. Folk and prog and Rip Waitman and whatever. So, um, but coming in at number five in my Straub's top five from the Witchwood from um, 1971. Okay, number four is the previous album and the first one to feature Rick Waitman as a uh, full time member, which is actually a live album. Uh, although I've included it in this because it's all new material pretty much. Uh, it's called uh, Just a Collection of Antiques and Curios, and um, has a rather interesting little sleuth like a. It's like a, some sort of charity shop window or antique shop window, which I think is that. <laughs> that's, that's what it's meant to be. But um, got this lovely uh, leather, uh, fake leather finish on the thing. There's a shot of the band at the back. Uh, Rick Waitman looking very young there. In fact, when I saw that, he looks a bit like a young James Hetfield with Metallica on there. So quite interesting. But yeah, this was the. Um, uh, I think this was the first album to feature that lineup. Um, Rick Waitman had joined. He, he appeared on the previous album, which was called Dragonfly, as a session musician, and he joined the band for this. This live album was recorded at the uh, Queen Elizabeth Hall, which is part of the Royal Festival Hall in London. And we have um, uh, John Ford and um, Richard Hudson uh, were on this as well. I think I, I think they may be on the first album. I can't quite remember, to be honest. I didn't, didn't research too much about this, to be honest. Uh, Tony Visconti was a producer actually it was quite interesting um, he, also, he also produced from the Witchwood American producer perhaps best known particularly in this period for producing T-Rex and David Bowie so um, for him to produce this kind of like folky kind of stuff is quite interesting he has done other folk stuff I think he produced stuff for Ralph McTell and people like that but um, but yeah this was quite an interesting album particularly with it being live like I say it's all it's all um, new material uh, except for one song which is rah, 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 where is the dream of your youth, which closes side two, which I think was on their debut album? Um, there's a the centre spread there, a bit of a strange it's an engraving on the front. I'm not quite sure who did the sleeve for that there, but um, but yeah, it's, it's not bad. He got uh, Martin Luther King's Dream opens it up. The Antiques Suite, which is a longer track, which is split into um, I think I think split into different sections. Uh, side one closes with a track called Temperaments of Mind, which is basically just a uh, Rick Wakeman piano solo. His piano solo became quite famous um, um, in later years when he was with Yes, which was uh, great, very fun, showing off his skills, a very flamboyant, a bit of comedy in there. Some of his solo stuff thrown in, but a classical, um, which is pretty good. And uh, this is the one that really got the media attention for Rick, where he became the star of the future, and he was, um, you know, sort of like this new keyboard wizard. So. But uh, yeah, it's not not a bad album actually. It's like, uh, I slightly like it better than uh, from the Witchwood. Um, I think it has that kind of um, impromptu kind of sound about it. With it being a live album, and uh, still very acoustic because the Strobs basically are an acoustic um, band. Lots of acoustic guitars, mandolins, and things. But um, yeah, worth worth investigating as both a studio folk album and um, I'm sorry, as a Strobs album and a live album. So you know, it's uh, well worth looking into. Um, number four in my Straub's uh, countdown here. Okay, now moving on to number three, which is probably their best known release. It's certainly their most successful. Came out in uh, 1973. It's called Bursting at the Seams. And uh, that looks more like a live album. <laughs> I mean, if we look at the sleeve there, I think people are confused. Oh, it's just a live album. But no, this was a um, studio album. Now this is the one that uh, I think. Uh, let's see now, what happened? Um, blah, blah, blah. Tony Hooper left by this point. Yeah, I think the previous, the one, the album before this, Grave New World, was the one where they turned a bit more proggy. 
sort of moving away from the folk kind of sound. And um, Tony Hooper wasn't really into that. He wanted to stay, keep with the folk, the folk roots, and he decided to leave, so he'd left the band. A guy called Dave Lambert joined for this. Um, where is he? Where's Dave Lambert? I think that's him there. But, uh, yeah, you've got um, uh, Hudson and Ford on, on the, at the rhythm section again, and uh, Blue Weaver on keyboards. He's the guy who replaced Rick Waitman. Blue Weaver is a bit of an unknown quantity in the... Prog rock history actually is one of those uh, sort of like ignored uh, keyboard types. Uh, he's a Welsh Welsh guy. He was in the Welsh band uh, Amen Corner in the sixties during their successful years, and he joined Straubs later, and then later went on to um, join Bee Gees uh, through their most successful period, right up to the you know through the Saturday Night Fever era. So he was quite a um, quite an adaptable keyboard player. He did lots of involved in lots of genres, but for me, he's always been. Uh, uh, best known was member member of Straubs for uh, even though for a short period he was, was on two of their, their two of their best out or two of their better albums really so but anyway yeah this is good and it's uh, charted pretty well and it contains their two best known songs uh, Lay Down and Part of the Union which were both uh, hit singles in the UK Part of the Union almost made number one it's a bit of a protest song uh, anti government kind of thing. But uh, yeah, I think they've gone for a bit more of a radio-friendly thing with this. It's kind of shorter tracks. The kind of biblical-sounding, hymnal kind of sounding thing is still there. It's uh, still quite acoustic in the main, a bit more up-tempo on some of the parts. Hudson Ford, as uh, they're the ones that wrote part of the Union, their, their sound was a lot different, a bit more up-tempo. They actually left to form their, their own band called Hudson Ford a bit later. They had, a, had their own, um, their own um, hits, and their, some, some albums. But uh, yeah, it's, it's it's not too bad. It's it's pretty good. You got Stormy Down, which is a very sort of English folk kind of sounding um, uh, song written by uh, Cousins. Uh, Tears and Pavan, The Winter and the Summer, which is a Lambert song. Uh, Lay Down as a Cousins song. That was the other thing. And then the track called Thank You at the end, which is a strange thing, where the the, the band uh, just recorded in a, I think it's in a school with some school kids singing along. But um, quite yes. In, Interesting album, actually, worth worth checking out. Um, like I say, it's got their two um, big hits on there. So, um, yeah, there we go. I think that's all from that. A bit like, It's a little bit heavier in parts, but um, Straub's never really got that heavy. And it's number three in my um, ranking here. So, on to number two. This was um, the last one I bought for them, I think. Uh, the last one I bought of them. Um, 1974 it came out um, then in Hero and Heroine. Which uh, critics said is their most proggy, um, and, and possibly right. It's it's, it's up there, um, but um, this was really, this was the one at least after burst, bursting at the seams, and the band had fallen apart again by then. There was only um, uh, the Daves, Dave Cousins and Dave Lambert, were the only ones who, that left in the lineup. So they just uh, they had to to, to re regroup. They brought in a guy called John Harkin on keyboards. Uh, he was he previously played with the Renaissance. I can't remember who he was with before that. A guy called Chas Cronk came in. He was from Juicy Lucy, and uh, Rod Coombs on drums, who was a, had been a member of Steelers Wheel. Uh, th this is uh, definitely more rocky in parts, and the prog thing has come to think from more of the use of Mellotron um, from the new keyboard player. Um, which is a, it's, it's, it sounds pretty good actually. The, the lyrics are a bit straight, more straightforward on this, um, moving away from that kind of fantasy stuff and the more sort of like spiritual um, lyrics on the previous um, uh, albums. And it's even a bit, it's a bit doomy and gothic in part. I don't know whether you know whether that was a deliberate or not, or just a sign of the times we were going through the the seventies, which was a bit of a dark period in the UK. But um, yeah, it's, it's not too bad. It's got some um, fairly good tracks on it. Has the, the band looking a bit angelic on the back there? <laughs> so anyway, so yeah, you got Autumn Her uh, Heroine's theme, um, which is well. Uh, let's see, Autumn is like the um, the, the longer track the split into um, sub sub tracks. Uh, Sad young man, just love shine on silver sun. Hero and heroine, uh, which I think was released as a single. Midnight Sun. Sun's mentioned quite a bit here, isn't it? Hero's theme closes the album. Lay a little light on me is quite a good, got a good track. But yeah, it's not too bad. But like, like most of the Straubs, there's something I wouldn't listen, don't really listen to nowadays. Uh, I gave them all a little, little spin before I did this uh, thing, but I, I didn't really sort of like get too involved in them. But um, yeah, like I say, this was the last one I bought. 
before move, moving on and um, there we go so hero and heroine number two in my uh, straws top five here now if anyone saw my prog top ten that I did a few months back they'll probably realize what my favorite straws album is it's uh, 1972's Grave New World which is uh, probably the only one I can still actually listen to and enjoy uh, really but um, it's featured a couple of times on this channel, once in the uh, the prog thing, also once for the sleeve. Uh, I was doing um, things on um, album art where they've used famous paintings, and of course you've got the uh, William Blake painting there on the cover. This is one of those, uh, I think I mentioned in that, it's a triple gatefold, so no expense spared by the record company. So that's how it spreads out in the middle, it's very sort of grand. It's actually that way, which way up is it? That way up. I think. Can't tell. Is that that way up? Yeah, it goes like that. It's all silver and, and glowing, so it's all very all very Lord of the Rings and fantasy. But the big news is, um I mentioned I think I mentioned last time there was the there was a booklet. There was a booklet in this and I thought I'd lost it, but I've since found it. It got stuck in the stuck in another album, so I've actually got the booklet back now, which is great, with all the lyrics in and the uh, bits of artwork and things. So it's uh, you can see it's a nice, nice little um prints in there. Well, um, I think they're etchings or engravings or something, but uh, yeah, I was quite very pleased about that. But anyway, I go on, I talk about this album in detail on the Prog Rock Top 10. It is a, it is a pretty good album. This is, um, I mean, I don't, I don't think Straub's really had a classic lineup because they, they change too often, but uh, I think if any lineup I've said is my favourite Straub's lineup, this is the one. You've got um, two original members, um, <coughs> excuse me, Tony Hooper. And uh, Dave Cousins, and you got um, Hudson for the rhythm section, and uh, Blue Weaver on keyboards. Uh, the great, the best thing about this was, of course, they this is the lineup that reformed in '83. They um, went off, they split up, were on hiatus for quite a few years, and then um, reformed in '83. And uh, it was this lineup, and I got to see them a couple of times, which I thought was pretty good. I thought, well, for old times' sake, I'll you know, see Straubs and. Um, really enjoyed it, and uh, then of course I think the lineup just dissolved again, and. Uh, Carried on, but I didn't really follow them as such. I mean, '83, I, my, my my taste in music had changed quite a bit by then, but I still, I still have got the memories of this, and uh, they played a few tracks off this this album, and it, and it was just great. So um, there we go. So um, so that's that. That's my um, top five Straub's albums. So um, another part of my musical youth, as it were. So all good fun. Okay, right, I've got one more of these to um, come, which I'll hopefully do in the next couple of days, and then um, back to some proper top tens later. So uh, I hope any of you found that interesting. Um, and uh, that's that. So uh, I can't imagine anyone rushing out to listen to the Strawberry Back catalogue on, on, on my uh, on my uh, ranking there. But anyway, it's up to you. Um, anyway, once again, I uh, hope you enjoyed that. Thank you for being there, and I'll catch you next time. Bye for now.